Um, thank you very much, Charlie. And what a thrill to have the opportunity to ask some of the many questions I and everyone joining us as part of COGEX have to you all. Thank you to Joanna, Megan, Tony, um, and Sarah for joining us today. Very, very quick uh, background. I remember in 2016, I was with Sarah in Palo Alto and she shared this two minute mini trailer in its earliest version of what has now become, uh, you know, the number one iTunes documentary. And I fell in love with the story. I, I couldn't believe it hadn't been told. And a few years later, it's won a ton of film festival awards, including Tribeca, number one on iTunes with no marketing budget and has created a huge audience of fans, many of whom are joining us today. Um, you know, General Magic is truly a documentary for our time. And what I'd love to focus on today is the lessons that you all learned from your time at General Magic and how you applied them in what came next and, and what you're doing today. So perhaps I can kick off by asking Sarah, who uh, produced and directed the movie, why now? What was it that so many years later prompted you to make this incredible movie? Well, I had my own very eviscerating experience with failure, which got me thinking about the role of failure in bringing big ideas to life. And but more importantly, I think I'm just fascinated with what are the ingredients that have to come together? What are the characteristics of people that have to come together to really, um, when you have a vision, to actually make that a reality in the world? And I'm very particularly interested in sort of life-changing, world-changing ideas. And so that sort of set off this exploration of, this extraordinary company, General Magic, and all of the people that came together at General Magic with this vision of inventing and developing the first handheld communicator. And then the journey it took to actually get to that point, which took you know the failure of the company and many iterations before that actually became our reality. Um, but I think it's those lessons that are fascinating to me because I think they're universal. And I think they, thinking about it today, and I think it's very similar to the heroine or the hero's journey, which is, that um, you know, you get the call to adventure. You have this vision, um, but actually bringing it into the world takes so much, and you know, you're challenged and tested on so many different fronts. But some of the characteristics that are important are things like endurance and persistence, and being able to really look at what's working and what's not working, and then just sometimes being able to stick with things through multiple iterations and multiple companies before they actually have the impact you want to see in the world. So that was the inspiration. And I'm just so thrilled to be joined with some of the original magicians who have had that impact in the world. Um, so we can hear from them in terms of what they were able to take from General Magic and implement in the amazing ideas that they've actually um, brought to life. Thank you. And, you know, Sarah, you mentioned the word persistence. And for anybody that's seen General Magic, the very definition of persistence was Tony. You know, we saw how he called and called and called and then called again until someone finally gave him a job, you know, from HR. Tony, you know, just to set the scene here, what was it about this place that was unknown, secretive, that was just so critical for you to be a part of? And obviously, you know, we'll hear in a minute with some other questions, has defined and impacted so many, um, you know, parts of your journey that came next. Why General Magic? Well, first, thanks, thanks. It's just wonderful to be here. Um, you know, why General Magic? I read this, just a few very small paragraphs in the back of Mac Week magazine back in the day, saying that, you know, Andy and Bill, Andy Hertzfeld and Bill Atkinson had left and started a new company and it was called General Magic. And that's all I read. And I was like, oh my God, what are they doing? And everybody, it was kind of a buzz and all of us little geeks, you know, little geek group, but there was no internet back then. There was nothing going on. All you had was like four sentences, but that was enough to get me going, whoa, the, the crazy guys who created Lisa and Mac and apps, parts of the Apple II, I was like, I wanna be like them. I wanna go work with them. And I was like, maybe this is my chance. It's a tiny little company. And that was really what it was all about. It was just the lore and just a few sentences. And after that, my mind was just focused that that is what I had to do. I had no idea what they were working on. You say maybe this was my chance, but I mean, some people say maybe this was my chance and they have a go or they have a couple of goes. I mean, you are the very definition of the word go. Um, <laughs> and, you know, thank, thank, goodness they, uh, thank goodness they invited you in. And, you know, what if I was to, to ask you, you know, if your early memories of the film and, and no doubt watching the, the movie has just sort of reminded you of many of the early days of, uh, you know, many of the early days, what was your first impression, um, you know, from this incredible crowd of people that you'd read about? I mean, it must have been mind blowing. 
It, well, the first, my first impression was I went into a very old, a, a tall building in Mountain View and they were only there. I only went there to just try to give my resume in at like eight in the morning. Um, and, and in the movie, I even talked about how it was just two people in those offices. So that was my first impression was this just tiny little office. And then the second time I went, it was the, the next building that General Magic had. And then, wow. It was one floor and all these amazing uh, people were running around that I knew or didn't know them, but I knew of them or I had read some books they have written or used some of their software. And I was like, oh my God, that's so and so. And, and then there was a video game machine and I'm sitting on the floor and it was just like, I, I was overwhelmed. And I was like, oh my God, I have, I, have, I have gotten into where I wanted to be. And now I see behind the scenes. And I was like, I was just, I was just so excited. I, I couldn't. So a, a little bit like me asking you questions for COGX, a little bit like that, perhaps. Uh, yeah, yeah th thank you very much for that background. And we also have uh, Megan Smith, uh, who's joining us today, who was, uh, an, you know, a, a, a critical part of the documentary. Megan, a question I have for you from my perspective as a female founder in, in software. There was a very diverse crowd at General Magic, from what I can see, and that's not the story of Silicon Valley today. And, and in a minute, I'd like to talk about, you know, the impact. But just if I was to sort of ask you to set the scene, was Silicon Valley different when you were working at General Magic? Was the company different? Were there different voices at the table? Because I saw a lot of different people that I don't necessarily see at the table so much these days. Yeah, I think, um, you know, software used to be more balanced. I mean, even we're talking, you guys are in the UK, Ada Lovelace, who invented coding and computer science, this idea of algorithms in the 1800s when Darwin was working. You know, women have always been at the table. And in General Magic, uh, we had incredible mentors and leaders like Tony. I was very, you know, we were either just out of school or one or two jobs, you know, a couple of years out of school. I had been in Apple Japan in Tokyo, which is how I met Bill Atkinson and Mark Pratt and, and the team. Um, and came in, but uh, you know, Joanna Hoffman, who's gonna be, you're gonna hear from soon, Susan Kerr, so many, uh, so many extremely talented women who had contributed at the most elite levels. Uh, we were not as racially diverse as we needed to be. Um, and that's something that Silicon Valley really has a lot of work to do still. Um, this idea of unconscious and conscious bias, uh, prioritization of certain topics and other topics, we'll get into that because really tech and innovation is for any topic in the world, uh, especially right now looking at justice and equality. You know, we can use data science and tech for that. Um, but at the time we were, we were um, very focused on this generalized platform, this idea, you know, what has become, you know, our, our fabulous uh, smartphones, but this idea of something that could support you in your life, that could connect you uh, with the network, the way that we're connecting today more utopian than some of the dystopian terrible things that sometimes people are using, uh, you know, propaganda machines and other things, um, cyber attacks. But the positive side was what we were directed at. And definitely the ideas were coming from everyone. And Silicon Valley had more women uh, in leadership at the time. Thank you very much for that. And last but not least, we've got Joanna, um, who's joining us today from the Valley. Joanna, you came from Apple. And uh, as much as you're going to hate me saying this, for those watching who've seen the Steve, Steve Jobs movie, Kate Winslet was lucky enough to play Joanna in the movie. Joanna, you came out of a company that had essentially created the future with personal computers. You know, it was originally unimaginable. What was it that made you believe that there was a company that could do the same again? You know, t twice in a career. What was it that attracted you to move into General Magic? Uh, like Tony, it was the people, you know, uh, I had worked with these amazing individuals before, not Mark Perad, but certainly Bill Atkinson and Andy Hertzfeld and, uh, and, uh, and Susan Kerr. Uh, so um, I, was, uh, I was really uh, drawn by the, uh, by, the, by the vision of Mark Perad and the fact that there were uh, two individuals that I really uh, uh, trusted and uh, and had great respect for, who had uh, joined his vision. And you know, the, the, the thing uh, that when I was watching the movie, I realized that one of the things that um, hit me when uh, Sarah was, was actually, uh, and her crew were filming, is that they asked me to look at this book of ideas that we had for General Magic. It was a, a, a big book with all the things that this personal communicator could become. And it's astonishing, just astonishing <laughs> how close it is to 
what actually happened, not only with this, but with all the accessories that you can add on to it, whether it's for health or whether it's for meetings or whether it's for sports or you know, it's, it's it's just astounding. I have forgotten in intervening years how much of that vision had been there. But you know what? I mean, visions are they great for attracting people to come together and work on them. However, <laughs> you know, it's not worth a dime if you can't make it into a reality. So, um, but in some ways, I just, I'm about to contradict the statement that I just made. It is worth a dime in that you pave the way, even if you have a monumental failure like, like General Magic. It's, uh, uh, it really, um, I think, opened up the eyes of a lot of people of what could be done. And we were very fortunate, I think, in our failure, in that the person who had actually uh, started the, uh, the personal computer uh, uh, revolution, uh, popularizing personal computers and so on, Steve Jobs, was the one that picked up this vision and actually made it real. And so um, in, in many ways, it, you know, it was a failure, but it was also a huge success in a sense that uh, it, uh, it really happened. It just happened, you know, many, many years later. But as I said, we were fortunate on who picked up the vision and made it, and made it real. So, um, uh, you know, as far as uh, why I joined, it was the com division and combined with these amazing individuals. Thank you. And, and so, you know, Joanne, I have to just ask you, how many of those red books exist? Because if I had a dollar for every time someone said, could we read that, that red book anywhere? I don't know the answer. It's, uh, you know, you have one, Mark Porat has one. Actually, I don't have one. It's, uh, uh, Sarah brought Mark's copy to me uh, for the for the movie so that I could look at it again. Um, you know, there were a, a couple copies, but I don't know. I, I the only one I know of is the one that that Mark. Okay. Uh, I would love right. to have one. <laughs> we should get yeah. to get a few together and and make some for all of us. Yeah, it would be well, we're going to talk about you know, next, what we can all learn from General Magic. And, you know, I have to ask the question, which is, you know, we've seen the film, maybe now we need the book. I don't want to give Sarah more work to do, but I, I definitely agree with Tony. Um, you know, uh, Sarah, for setting the scene about what came next, Joanna said that, uh, you know, you, General Magic, we're fortunate that others picked up the vision and uh, others made it real. Can you tell us a little bit about um, what came out of General Magic? We're going to dig down in a minute into Tony and, and the iPod, the iPhone, and Nest. But you know, <laughs> who was that? There are so many stories, and there are so many, uh, you know, emojis that the the kind of treasure chest mm -hmm. of things created under the General Magic roof uh, that we have all the magicians to thank for. Can you provide us with a little bit of context on that? Other founders that that started at General Magic. Can you set the scene for us there? Yeah, there were so many technological breakthroughs that came out of General Magic and some amazing cultural phenomena. You know, I think about a guy called Pierre who was in developer relations and um, famously had a desk that was piled with paper. And when asked, he would say, oh, it's checks. And, um, you know, when you asked him what the checks were for, he would just say, oh, it's a little auction company that I've started. Um, and also, you know, our general counsel, Mike Stern, who's also the executive producer of this movie, had a meeting with Pierre and Pierre said, hey, Mike, I've got this idea for this auction company. Do you want to invest? And Mike was like, this is a dumb idea. Trusting people on the internet. Good luck with that. That turned out to be eBay. So that's one of the most famous examples. But so many incredible things. And today, you know, when I think about people today that you may not have heard of, like a guy called Andy Reveille, who's got a company called Pure Watercraft, and they're developing um, uh, electric boats. Um, I think, you know, so many examples and the work that Megan's doing in terms of helping people all over the world use technology for social change. Um, and what and are you uh, what are you doing, Sarah? You know, how did mm -hmm. your experience of general magic hit you and, and latterly, you know, reminding yourself of the lessons through the kind of laborious and long process of making this movie? How has it impacted what you're doing today? I think for me, it's really a, a blueprint of how you do bring ideas to life and what it takes. And as I said, I think there are some common characteristics. Probably the most important one for me is persistence. You don't quite know 
I mean, no one can accurately predict the timing of when, you know, your idea and the, and the world will intersect in a way that's, you know, meaningful and scalable. Um, but I think if you really believe and are passionate about an idea, hold on to that. And, um, and the persistence piece is critical, but also this thing that, that Tony, I think for me, is, is really represents. And that's this notion of really looking hard at what's not working and what is. And I think that's really, really, really key. And I see very few people who do that. My current team at Chiron Medical are very good at that, very open, very open to suggestions and changes. Um, and I think, and that's what we're doing now. We're, we're sort of taking all the lessons that we've collectively learned and applying it to the area of cancer detection and AI. Um, and I think we have a resilience and we have a, a long sight and a commitment that some version of this will be a reality and will mean that women are having their breast cancer detected earlier. So that's what I hold on to. It's that sort of like, it may not come in the form we want. It may take longer than we think. It may not take longer. But persistence and that willingness to really look at what's working and not working, I think, is just the key. Thank you. And Tony, how did you recover from your idols failing? You know, what came next? Was it iPod, iPhone and Nest all in quick succession, easy peasy? Or uh, was the journey slightly different? It was definitely not easy and it, it didn't come quickly. Um, no, really, after well, I, the only reason why I left General Magic was to be able to actually create a General Magic based device that I thought could be successful. So I actually left General Magic to go to one of the partners that you saw in the movie to go and try to make my own device with the team, obviously, to then make General Magic successful. So that's what the whole reason why I'm leaving. And then Obviously, when General Magic went down, it wasn't much I could do in that case to try to, you know, uh, build another product based on it. So I literally had a decade of failure, a total decade of failure, trying you know, five years, six years, trying to get General Magic to go. And then after that, it was, uh, you know, it was uh, my own company. And then the Internet crash happened of 2000. And uh, it, I just and it was always hard work. It was always trying to push the push the boundaries, uh, picking yourself up, trying again and trying again. And at the end of those 10 years, especially with the Internet uh, crash, uh, it, it was really tough. We had um, uh, a small company and I had to give 80 pitches to VCs, venture capitals, 80 of them. And all 80 said no. They absolutely said no to you. So to, to, to go through a decade of kind of this you know, gut wrenching failure and just people saying, no, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. It just, it hurt. But that set the stage for the next 10 years and beyond, which was, you know, the iPod and, and then the iPhone, which was general magic all over again. And then, and then other things. So, so lots of stuff going on, but we had to just really, a lot of us, it wasn't just me, but other general magicians had to work for that whole decade till they actually saw success a, a decade later. Um, and uh, uh, so it was really perseverance that won in the end. And, you know, we all are all great friends and we all helped each other through those trying times and uh, still are today. And so it's wonderful to have that, that even if you failed and you failed together, you learn so much together and you can actually create the future together. Well, I think you showed those ATVCs, Tony. That's, um, that's, it's always a good reminder, you know, many, many people listening in today are either entrepreneurs or, or working in business. And it's, you know, it's good to hear you say it was always hard work and you had to pick yourself up off a decade of failure because, you know, right now I know that, uh, you know, speaking for myself, fellow founders, um, people in entrepreneurial businesses, there is so much uncertainty and it is extremely challenging uh, to do that every single day. And, and um, but, the, but that's what we must do. And, well, we and it's, it really, it's really interesting because I, we have, we have, we, we're investors and we have uh, over 200 companies in our portfolio. And literally the eight weeks of COVID going on, 10 weeks of COVID when the shutdowns were going, we were literally in the financial intensive care unit helping every single one of these companies, helping founders get through all of these different uh, challenges because they had never seen a downturn before, many of them young founders. So you had to be there to be the rock, to be giving them advice. And it's wonderful to see what happened over that, just that period of time and how we've reset and changed things and made things better. 
um, as Megan was saying, how do we go about and and take this opportunity and crisis and make it better? And so it felt like I was back in those you know those failure days. But what could we what we could do to not repeat those mistakes? What could we do to make the companies that uh, are struggling to make them stronger so they can go through this and have a better plan and and hopefully change the world as they intend? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Tony, for that. Megan, a quick question for you, and then we're going to take some from um, from the audience. What do you carry with you from General Magic today that could serve as advice for anyone listening? Because I know that you too have navigated tricky waters, challenging roles, and of course, you know, in your role as Chief Technology Officer underneath Obama, um, you know, you must have had a lot of pressure um, in that role. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, and, and listening, I really resonate with everything everyone's saying. And I think there's a couple things. One is around persistence. Um, some of it is direct persistence, like physically the idea of, you know, Tony, as you said, you, you know, spun out sort of two companies later, you end up working on the iPod and creating that. And then the iPhone comes, you know, Andy Rubin, Andy Droid Android was with us, of course, at General Magic. And he, um, I think three companies later, he goes General Magic, Danger, and eventually Android. Uh, and through video iterations. And Grace Hopper, the woman who invented coding languages, people told her that was a dumb idea. She felt you could broaden participation if we could code in an Englishy like human language like Python and, and Java and others and instead of machine code. And, and people tried to get her not to do that. Luckily, she stayed with it. And she has a, had a thing, don't let them tell you you're wrong if you're not. So that's one part of it which is, you know, Tony going to the ADVCs and keep going. There's a second part of it, which is listening well to that uh, input and adapting and, and doing pilots and testing and really prototyping, rapid prototyping, doing as part of, instead of sort of planning, get out there and do and iterate and understanding you're part of an ecosystem. General Magic certainly was very early. When we were working, people didn't have email really other than at the universities with the internet. and. And they really didn't know what we were talking about. And people were like, why would I want to take something with me? And so it took the ecosystem to come together. And remember, you're part of just like our living planet. You're part of an ecosystem. And how do you fit into that and experiment? That is very important. The other thing I think that comes out of General Magic and in general, it's a historic, it's a history thing of apprentice journey mastery. We were really lucky to be working with Joanna and, and all of the teams that had done so much before us. And the more we can get on a mode, in the world of knowing that everyone is talented. We have 7 billion plus colleagues in the world and we could include everyone and figure out how to get rid of the bias on who gets funding um, and really reach out, use the internet to find people who've already fixed things regionally. That's a real opportunity that we have and go on these paths um, of innovation and supporting innovators, so solution makers, no matter where they are. That's something we do with Shift7 working with Communities all over the world, people on islands who have genius ideas and already solving climate issues, people on reservations, Native American communities with great solutions already who aren't getting the kind of Silicon Valley attention that others are. It's an and, you know, innovators. We do the United Nations Solution Summit. So these are just ways to be much broader about defining the problems that we have. The sustainable development goals from the UN include justice, equality, you know, climate infrastructure, all these things that we need as humanity. We need to really work on climate change, all this. It's in the talent of all of us. And so perhaps General Magic can be uh, a valuable storytelling method of seeing how to come together as a team and also how to iterate and know that even if your idea is not exactly right, um, in the beginning, if you work with others and listen well, but don't give up and persist, things can happen, whether they're directed like the phones themselves, or whether they're in a broader way of impacting the world with using technology for good and data science for good. Ida B. Wells just won the Pulitzer Prize 100 years later for her data science and journalism work on, uh, on intense stories about um, justice. I encourage people to look up her story. We can use data science for justice and inclusion, just like self-driving cars. Well, there you have it. And therein lies the answer to everything. We could listen to you all day, Megan, uh, Megan for president. Um, on that note, <laughs> a question a question for Joanna. Um, you know, there's a real cult of leadership and a real cult of quite often white male leadership that stems out of um, technology companies. We all read about it. You know, Zuckerberg is the leader of Facebook. Um, how a, a practical lesson, given your experience of working with so many um, with, with so many interesting people, how 
would you help people within an organization to decouple ego from their work to really be able to look at what's working and what's not? Because what Tony and Megan and Sarah have all mentioned is it's really important to do that, to constantly look inside and to question those things. And perhaps had that have been you know, done more at General Magic, things might be different. Um, you know, what's your suggestion on leadership styles and really strong personalities and you know, making sure, frankly, that there are more people being heard at the table, as Megan said? Wow, that's a that's a difficult question. Just a quick question for you, Joanna. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, um, first of all, I want to say that leadership is extremely important. Obviously, individuals make a huge difference, and uh, the, um, the 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 idea that uh, uh, that it's it's a group effort, yes. But if you don't have a leader to bring it all together, nothing nothing really. Uh, productive results in the end. So uh, leadership is very important. Leaders almost by definition, if they are <laughs> if, if they are uh, strong in one area, have quirks and are flawed. And so we have to accept the fact that you if you have a, a leader, it's a human being and it's, he's going to be flawed. The question is how flawed, how ignorant and um, how devious, and um, you know, I, I I am coming to the realization that today we have a lot of leaders who are just genius in what they have accomplished and what they have done at a very young age. And I'm not sure if the right age is is a factor or if it's the um, education that's a, a factor. But what I find is uh, that they are remarkably ignorant on what they are sowing in the world. And uh, it comes from, I think, partly ignorance of history, partly ignorance of human nature. Um, I hope they're not just plain evil, but, um, you know, as I look at Facebook, for example, uh, I keep thinking, is uh, are they really that ignorant, or is this like <laughs> by something uh, more, more uh, darker than um, than what appears? I have enormous respect for what they have accomplished, but uh, but at the same time, destroying the very fabric of democracy and de destroying the very fabric of human relationships, and peddling in an addictive drug called anger. Um, you know, it's just like tobacco. It's no different than the opioids. It, it, we know anger is addictive. We know we can attract people to our platform and get engagement if we get them pissed off enough. Uh, so therefore what? We should capitalize on that each and every time. Um, so I, I, I am actually not that positive, unfortunately, because I don't see these people um, either learning or um, understanding or empathizing of what I see is dissimulating. What I see is pretending. What I see is um, leaders identifying themselves so much with, um, with their uh, product uh, or with with being profitable, which which is not necessarily even greed, it's the validation of their vision, right? That they cannot see past that to say, well, what is the what are some of the global impacts of what we're doing? And so, while leadership is extremely important, almost every organization will mimic uh, the strengths and the weaknesses of its leader. And uh, and humans being human, you are going to get uh, a, a quite a number of weaknesses. And so the thing is that, you know, what, what do you do with that? What would you do with that is you have presumably functioning government and rules and regulations. They can look in the past and look and say, wait a second, this is not the first time it's happening. Of course, it's happening on a much larger global scale and simultaneity is another problem, right? Uh, that is happening everywhere at the same time. Um, so uh, yes, but in the past we have had to deal with some of these issues before and we had created laws that had managed to bring in 
uh, and rein in some of these uh, uh, immense flaws in the people who also innovated and did, did great things for humanity. So, um, but right now I don't see that happening either. So, uh, Megan was talking about all the positive sides, and this is the Eastern European in me coming back with all things, you know. I mean, the, uh, a darker side of humanity kind of thing. But, uh, but you know, we, th there is a platform that has been created that nobody could dream of. This is an amazing platform for humanity to come together, as Megan said, to do the, all these amazing things, to this in incredible thing. And even individuals can here and there and everywhere combine together and there is a strength in numbers and achieve something on this platform that's positive. But unfortunately, all it takes is a minority of the same kind of evildoers finding uh, their community and coming together and undermining everything. And destruction, entropy is much more powerful than construction. You know, it's much, much easier to destruct than to construct. And what you need is now uh, governance. What you need is laws that can... Um, that can rein in some of these uh, very nefarious uh, uh, consequences. Um, thank you, and, Joanna. And Megan, I saw you nodding your head. You know, that obviously resonated with you. Some thoughts from you, perhaps? Well, just I would say, you know, I really, really, yeah, I just have to agree. Resonate is a good word. Um, a couple of quick things. One is uh, the Gloria Steinem, incredible equality leader, says the world is linked, not ranked. And a lot of times there's a lot of hierarchy about what topics are more important and get more fuel or funding, what people get more. And really, if we could be more balanced. So, for example, I think if Silicon Valley had more gender, race, uh, other kinds of balances, it, people would bring priorities forward. And, uh, you know, there's one group that gets to set the agenda and others have to try to get a word in edgewise. So the feature sets that would solve some of the bullying or uh, challenges that um, have been devastating, you know, where are the Rohingya members of the tech team uh, and other, you know, so let's add in more voices in the design seat as we do stuff so we don't make as many mistakes and leave features, you know, on the floor when they could have been at the core of the product. The other thing that we reflect on uh, is um, it's more of an and, and I wanted to share this. It's a, a tweet I put up about the SpaceX launch, um, NASA, and we were celebrating you know, but at the same time, a lot of people don't know at the Apollo 11 launch that, sorry, I'm holding it the wrong way, Ralph Abernathy led a protest of 500 people and the head of NASA came out and he said, you know, if I could push a button and solve poverty, I definitely would not launch to the moon. And so I think you can, there are ways, these are harder problems than the moonshot, but solving poverty, data science for justice, all of the challenges we have for climate change, this is a real opportunity and this is not a new problem. You know, Albernethy says a great nation ought to be able to take care of those who are less fortunate as well as undertake space exploration. And so really the privileged often don't see the challenges that everybody's facing. And so it could be quite a real opportunity um, to, uh, a real opportunity to broaden the platform like the sustainable development goals that we've set together as a UN and then scout around, scout around the world who, for who already, already has solutions or promising things and be much more balanced. Um, we were able to have a gender balance, race balance, topic balance, location balance, set of solution makers at the United Nations working on all the different challenges. Let's get everyone in in that way and set the priorities higher for that, uh, including our young people, active STEM in the classroom, so it's more interesting to everyone. Um, thank you very much, Megan. I have a, a short question for Sarah and Tony before we then go to the audience Q&A. So from the, the darker side of, of humanity to happier paths, Tony, a very quick, easy question for you. Uh, okay. What should we be optimistic about and can you tell us what the future looks like? <laughs> well, oh, okay, that's an easy one. I just uh, thought I'd end with a, no, with a pretty quick one. We should be optimistic that if you look at the change that's going on and how many things are, are being disrupted but actually coming out and hopefully on the other side through these crises that we're having 
and these long, we're going to see change. We're going to see positive change if we, if we invest in it. And, you know, I already know that I've talked to many families and many companies and founders are thinking differently about how they're building their teams, their, their, their companies, how they interact with each other. I'm, I'm, you know, when these, these periods, these tough times come, this is when we rise up and we go and say, let's fix all the things we needed to fix. We knew we needed to fix. And so the, the amount of change that we've had in literally three months versus what we've talked about in the industry and in various other ways in, in a decade or more has happened. And so that always shows that we can change if we just so want it. And we just have to, uh, you know, grab it and do it. And we show people how, what the future will look like. So just like, you know, we got to this point from General Magic 30 years ago when we showed the change and we, we, we pushed along. And then all of a sudden, 20 years later, boom, the breakthrough happened and the world changed with, you know, smartphones. Even though we started 20 years, that's the same way we're going to have to be with climate change and all of these other big topics, uh, um, race relations, all of these things. And it only happens because we make it change and we put our heads together and our hearts together and our hands together and we do it and we make it happen. And it may not just happen tomorrow, but it will happen sooner or later if we just try. And, and if we fail, we try again. Keep going. Keep going. A good lesson for us all. Uh, Sarah, I have a question for you. We've only got you know a few minutes left. I wanted to end on a few positive things from everybody. Yeah. Everyone from my auntie who can barely use an iPhone loved the movie because it made her rethink her life and how she views her successes and failures all the way through to all the startup founders who love the movie because of the craziness of the teams and the offices, albeit most of us didn't have rabbits running around in our office, or I certainly don't. Um, were you surprised by the huge success of the film? And, and of course, it still has so much further to go. And what are you hoping that the legacy will be? Um, for me, it was always about encouragement. It was always about the um, that encouragement to keep going. Um, and I think that overcomes so much. I mean, Tony's rallying cry about how, you know, with the will and the passion and the hands and the work, there's so much that we can get done. I truly believe that. And I think um, the other ingredient is encouragement, to encourage each other and support each other when it isn't easy. Um, is really important. And then there's the listening piece of it. It's just to listen well, to listen better, to listen what's really important. Uh, so I think for me, that's really it. If the movie can give anyone who is thinking of giving up or um, or maybe who's given something up, but is you know it's still tugging at their heart, I guess that that's what I hope the legacy of the film is. Fantastic. Thank you. And Sarah, I have to ask you a quick extra little question in the middle because everyone has seen the movie or will see the movie. Just as an aside, how did you assemble all this footage, you know, into one movie? Who who had all this footage? Did you have it in your garage? What, where did it all come from? How, how well, did I get to see, you know, a Goldman Sachs investment banker with his shirt off trying to pitch General Magic for an IPO, which, by the way, I hope is something that I can replicate in my business next time around. Uh, well, the footage, I was very lucky to be at General Magic all those many years ago. So I was part of a documentary film crew filming. So we had that footage. And then when I started making the film with uh, my co-director, Matt Maud, we, um, we went on the search for footage and we found 600 tapes in Hawaii. We found another few amazing tapes from somebody else who recorded um, various episodes in history of General Magic as it, as it happened. So I think we just got really, really lucky that we, we had that footage, which makes, I hope, the experience more visceral. Um, so yes, just got very, very lucky. And I think uh, we offered anyone who is watching the ability to see the film, I believe Tabitha and the team at COGX is gonna share that tomorrow. If you haven't seen it, um, you will get the opportunity to see it via a free link. You mean they're not gonna have to go to iTunes and pay for it? <laughs> well, we would like to tweet if they like the movie or an IMDb recommendation, that would be nice. But there we but go. Well, there we are. That's a good pay it forward. If you watch it via COGX, be sure to do a to, to leave a review or some stars. Um, fantastic. Uh, it just leads me to thank all of you for joining today. I know we have a breakout session and the audience is going to have an opportunity to ask their questions. But Charlie, thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask Sarah, Megan, Joanna and Tony these questions and looking forward to continuing in a minute um, in the breakout session. Thank you, Emma. That was a fantastic panel. Obviously, as an entrepreneur myself, I, 
I certainly recognize the, um, the, the need to run through walls and just keep going. Uh, really, and thank you everybody involved in the panel. Uh, we are going to have a breakout Q&A session. So if you log into the COGX app, you'll be able to ask your questions and the panel's going to reconvene in just a moment. Uh, so that draws this session to an end. And thank you all for watching. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.